video will focus on the 1953 breakdown of Vivian Lee, a British actress who was born in India. Lee had many breakdowns, partly due to her bipolar disorder, and so I won't be going into all of them. I will be focusing on the 1953 incident, which was remembered by David Niven, David Niven, uh, one of her friends, and it is published in the biography Vivian Leigh by Hugo Vickers. In the account, Niven disguises Vivian's name as Missy because he was very close friends with her. He thought her especially honest, that she always took the sides of underdogs. She was always generous, especially as relates to the founding and production of the National Theater of England. Her love of laughter he appreciated. He knew she had genuine concern for her friends' welfares, and she was never bitchy about the beauty of other women. Vivian Lee was born in November 1913 in Darjeeling, British India. She was the only daughter of Ernest Richard Hartley, a British broker, and his wife, who was a devout Roman Catholic. Um, Lee was encouraged to read and perform theatrically when she was very young. Her first role was in her mother's amateur theater group reciting Little Bo Peep. At the age of six, Lee was sent by her mother from Laredo Convent to the Convent of the Sacred Heart in Southwest London. This was traumatic to Vivian Lee. She loved her family and being so far away from her family in India, in the foreign world of London, was shocking to her. There is nothing to indicate in her biographies that she was abused while at the convent but we know from studies by the Manhattan Institute, for example, that teachers make up three-fourths of all child abuse outside the home in the United Kingdom and the United States. So I'm not sure if she was abused, but I think that she did have emotional issues after her convent stay, and um, I think that that might be one reason why. Lee wanted to be an actress since she was very young, and her father enrolled her at the Royal Academy of Dramatic Art in London. She then met Herbert Lee Holman, who was a barrister 13 years her senior in 1931. Despite his disapproval of theatrical people, they married in 1932, and she terminated her studies at the Royal Academy, and then in 1933, she gave birth to a daughter, Suzanne. So Lee was very young when she met and married Holman, still in her teens, and taking the sort of sheltered girl, convent school girl, straight into this marriage with a man who disapproved of her love of acting must have been somewhat emotionally difficult. In 1935, Lee met Laurence Olivier at the Savoy Grill, and she was introduced to Olivier uh, by one of her lovers, John Buckmaster. And the two had been watching each other's theatrical performances, and so their meeting in 1935 was exciting for both of them. In 1937, Olivier and Leigh began an affair while acting as lovers in the very patriotic film Fire Over England. Both of them were still married at the time, and this did not deter them. Olivier had a son, Vivian had a daughter, and they were both married, and yet they were drawn together and absolutely loved each other. And you can see this romance on screen in their films. You can see it in Fire Over England. You can see it in That Hamilton Woman. You can see it in film recordings of their plays together. They absolutely adored each other, and Vivian admitted that she worshipped Olivier, and Olivier's nickname for Vivian was Celestial. And so their love was just very deep, very intense. And Lee never shied away from reading the deep and emotional material that would make its way into her work. 
she read Gone with the Wind before she took the role on as Scarlett O'Hara. She read accounts of prostitutes before taking the role in Waterloo Bridge, which is incredibly tragic. And so she was reading material that affected her emotionally. By 1940, Lee and Olivier were married, and Lee campaigned very hard to have her husband star with her in various movies. He, she wanted him to star with her in Waterloo Bridge. However, the studios replaced him with Robert Taylor. Um, and so you see Vivian Lee really coming up against studio leadership and being shot down repeatedly. And studio leadership, including leadership at MGM, repeatedly said, oh, she's just so beautiful. You know, we don't really take her opinion seriously. She's an okay actress. And so you see this pressure on Vivian Lee because she wanted to spend time with her husband and was denied that. For example, when she was shooting Gone with the Wind, MGM prohibited uh, Olivier and Lee to see one another to the point where they actually paid for a guard to be stationed outside of Lee's house so she wouldn't see the man she loved. And this was something that Vivian Lee had to deal with her entire um, career. And it wasn't just men that put pressure on Vivian. Katherine Hepburn, the actress, competed with Vivian very hard for roles and would frequently um, persuade studio heads to not have Vivian take this or that role. And so it's, it's, she was getting, you know, all of this hate from many sides. On top of professional stress, Vivian Lee and Laurence Olivier found that after they returned to war-torn England in late 1940, their old house Durham Cottage was in ruins from a bomb raid. And so they found a house in 1944 that would serve as their marital estate until their divorce in 1960. It was a large stone abbey known as Notley Abbey in Buckinghamshire that had once been endowed by the real Henry V, and Laurence Olivier would glamorize Henry V in his wonderful patriotic film um, from the Shakespeare play. Olivier loved the house. Vivian was more nervous about it, and one of her friends, David Niven, said it looked absolutely hopeless. She got into it, though, and planted lovely rose bushes, which she took care of. Her gardens were always commented on by her peers as being beautiful, and she made the house into this sort of otherworldly paradise. They created a widow's walk along the driveway. Um, she would be pictured in a cloud of butterflies picking flowers deep in the herbaceous borders. Um, she, she loved gathering flowers, putting them inside the home, arranging them, and so Notley Abbey became her safe space. The house being rural was also incredibly important to Vivian, who was diagnosed with tuberculosis in 1944. She came, it was realized she had tuberculosis because she was touring North Africa as part of a review for the armed forces stationed in the region. And so, as was typical in her life, she was pushing herself to exhaustion. And she had to spend several weeks in the hospital in 1944 before she could recover. In 1945, she was filming Caesar and Cleopatra with Laurence Olivier when she discovered she was pregnant, but then she had a miscarriage. And so she fell into a deep depression she would fall to the floor, be sobbing, and this was considered one of the first of her major bipolar disorder breaks, breakdowns. And these would be categorized by her being hyperactive, followed by a period of depression and an explosive breakdown. And in 1945, on doctor's orders, she had to take a break from acting, and she resumed acting in 1946. In 1948, 
The Oliviers were expected to tour Australia and New Zealand to raise funds for the old Vic Theater, and they had a physical altercation with each other in Christchurch, New Zealand, when she couldn't find her shoes, and he screamed an obscenity at her and slapped her, and then she slapped him back. And unfortunately, physical fights would occur between the Oliviers in their marriage. Also adding pressure to the marriage was Olivier's friendship with the comedian Danny Kaye. Supposedly, Danny Kaye and Laurence Olivier had an 11-year affair, and this is something that the Kaye family has largely ignored, and so, you know, take it with a huge grain of salt, but Olivier was close to Danny Kaye, and while Kay's wife turned a blind eye thinking that there was just a lot of artistic and professional connections between the two men. We can see that Danny Kay was expected to socialize with Vivian Lee. And Vivian Lee was a great socializer when she was in a good mood. And she was remembered to dance all night, party all night. She could throw parties very effectively. And so the fact that this man that may or may not have been her husband's lover um, is seen in photos with her shows this additional pressure that would have been on Vivian Lee. And it's been written that the Olivier's had an open marriage. I don't think so. Based on comments that have been made by Laurence Olivier's son, Tarquin, I think any affair hurt Olivier very deeply, and I think likewise for Vivian Lee, who loved Olivier, and he was the love of her life. Another figure in the uh, Lee breakdown in the 1950s was the critic Kenneth Tynan, and Kenneth Tynan was born in 1927 in Birmingham, England, and he was very flamboyant, man. He attended Oxford. Uh, he had a great knowledge of Western literature, old literature, and his criticisms of Vivian Lee were very unkind. Very unkind. His slogan was, rouse tempers, goad and lacerate, raise whirlwinds. He was, he wanted to bring angry young playwrights onto the British stage. He didn't like the older style playwrights. And he loved, but he loved Olivier. And his reviews of Olivier were always remarkable. And in the 1960s, he asked to be employed by Olivier's National Theater. Olivier and Lee actually hosted Tynan at their home throughout his life, and so Lee was expected to play hostess to this very acerbic man. The following are criticisms Tynan published while being a friend of the Olivier's and staying in their home. In 1951, he said that Lay's was a mediocre talent that forced Olivier to compromise his own. He ridiculed her production in 1955, saying her range was not emotional enough. He also said her performance in Lady Macbeth was insubstantial and lacked the necessary fury demanded of the role. This, cr These criticisms of a man so close to her husband devastated Lee. Kenneth Tynan remembered later that while he was staying at the Abbey, Vivian Leigh tried to sleep with him, and she crawled into bed with him, and then when he rejected her because he was friends with her husband, she pouted. I kind of doubt this, but if it was true, we can interpret it many different ways, and one of the ways to interpret it is that Vivian and Olivier were actually very competitive with one another. They were competitive with each other in film roles, um, after Olivier did Wuthering Heights, which was remarkable, Lay wanted to show him up and did Gone with the Wind. So, you know, both of them were very, very driven theatrically. And so maybe this was a competitive thing with Kenneth Tynan. 
Regardless, Tynan's words should be taken with a grain of salt because he just did not like Vivian Lee. Other things that might have impacted Lee's breakdown in 1953 was the movement of Marilyn Monroe and her interest in more serious film roles. Um, the Prince and the Showgirl, which would be originally based on Vivian Lee's production with her husband, starred Marilyn in the 1950s, and seeing her husband with a very beautiful sex symbol would have impacted her. It said that she had a second miscarriage, or at least that's what was announced during The Prince and the Showgirl, but some biographers dispute this and said it was sent, uh, it was gossip sent out of Vivian Lee's camp just to keep the spotlight on her. Regardless, by 1953, Vivian Lee had starred in A Streetcar Named Desire as Blanche Dubois, which is a character that endures a rape and there are references to promiscuity and homosexuality and the film was very controversial. Um, it's one of her better known films today, but she encountered a lot of pushback on it. The critic J.B. Priestley denounced her performance in 1949. Um, her fellow actors and actresses were, became friends with her and loved her in A Streetcar Named Desire. She won the second Academy Award for Best Actress for her performance, but playing Blanche Dubois tipped Vivian Lee over into madness, and it was remembered that sometimes she would turn into Blanche Dubois after that film. This is an excerpt of the biography Vivian Lay by Hugo Vickers with a remembrance by David Niven of seeing Vivian Lee's 1953 breakdown. At six o'clock in the morning, May called me on the telephone. Mr. David, you have to get over here real quick. Something terrible's happened to Missy. Missy is Vivian Lee. What? I asked sleepily. She's possessed, that's what. You get over here real quick. Within 20 minutes, I drove up to the little white garden gate and jumped out of the car. May was waiting for me. She was shaking. She clutched my arm and repeated over and over, She's possessed. She's possessed. I'm quitting. I'm quitting. I tried to reassure her, but nothing would persuade her to come back into the house with me. So I took her key and watched her head quickly down the tree-lined street in the direction of Sunset Boulevard. She never looked back. It was still dark, and no lights showed in the small house as I quickly let myself in the back door. I didn't know what to expect, so I stood inside the kitchen and called out softly a few times, Vivian, it's David. There was no answer, then the sound of footsteps above. I pushed the swing door into the hall. Suddenly, all the lights went on, and there stood Vivian at the top of the stairs. Her hair was hanging down in straggly clumps. The mascara and makeup made a ghastly streaked mask down to her chin. One false eyelash was missing. Her eyes were staring and wild. She was naked and looked quite, quite mad. I had never seen real hysteria before and didn't know how to cope with it. I tried walking up the stairs toward her, but she backed away screaming, go away, go away, I hate you, don't touch me. When I tried to reason with her, she sat on the landing, alternately sobbing like a child and snarling down at me through the banisters like a caged animal. I knew I must get her a doctor, but the very mention of the word brought on the most terrifying reaction. I knew also that she must be overdue at the studio, and any minute the assistant director would be calling up to find out if she had overslept. Above all, I knew that if Vivian had cracked up, knew no word of it must leak out to the press or she'd be finished in Hollywood. In desperation, I tried an offhand approach. Look, darling, I said, you can sit up there on the floor as long as you like, but I'm bored and I want to watch TV. At that hour of the morning in the early days of TV, there were no programs on the air, but I had a feeling I must coax her downstairs and try to keep her busy. I switched on the set, which cracked and hummed and displayed nothing but horizontal lines, and settled myself on the sofa to watch. After a few minutes, the stairs behind me creaked, but I did not look around. I could sense that Missy was standing watching me. Then she came shyly into the room like a child 
and curled up on the sofa next to me to watch the blank screen with a funny private smile. We sat there together for a long while. Occasionally, she would let out a peal of laughter and point at the set. Sometimes, she would shrink back in horror. Once, she screamed with fear and moved up close beside me. Goosebumps rose on my back. I put my arm around her naked body to protect her from whatever it was she saw in her poor, faraway mind. She was icy cold. The phone rang in the kitchen. I glanced at my watch. It was only 8 o'clock, but I already felt I had been in that house for a lifetime. Having succeeded so far in calming her by playing a game of lies, I continued by saying, Oh, that's for me. I'll be back in a second. It was indeed the assistant director. Where the hell is she? He demanded. She's over two hours late. By a great stroke of good luck, I had worked with him before, and I knew him for one of that priceless breed of true professionals who can guide unsure directors, make life pleasant for actors, and save money for producers. Once he had identified it himself, I whispered down the phone, she's sick and it's real trouble, so for her sake, don't say a word to anyone except the producer. Tell the producer to come over right away. Not to come up to the house, just blow the horn in the street and all come out to him. I fetched Vivian's husband's overcoat from the hall closet and joined her once more before the TV set. She snuggled under the coat and clasped my hand. Isn't she lovely? She said, pointing at the empty screen. Around nine o'clock, I heard the front doorbell ring. Vivian was transformed. Don't let them in, she pleaded. They'll take me away. I promised that I wouldn't let anyone in if she would be a good little girl and go up to her room and shut the door. I watched her still gorgeous back view ascend the stairs. On the doorstep, I found a highly strung man. What gives, for Christ's sakes, he asked. And before I had time to phrase an answer, he added belligerently, and how did you get it get here? I brought the producer up to date and told him that in my opinion, she would be unable to report for work for some time. When he had gone, I found her crying among the shoes at the bottom of her wardrobe. After another hour of empty television, I claimed an urge for a cup of coffee, and I left her reacting to the horizontal flashes while I headed for the kitchen and another whispered phone call, this time to the new head of her studio. The only thing that matters is that girl's health, he said at once. We'll keep the picture going and wait for her as long as we can. If necessary, we'll recast and reshoot her part. But what about her? I underlined the urgent need for a doctor, and he instantly agreed to alert my old friend from Santa Monica, whose office, far from Beverly Hills, was unlikely to be infiltrated by gossip columnist spies, eager for the hot news of an impending abortion, a drying out, or a breakdown. He also promised to locate Olivier and get him an immediate message, telling him from me in the most urgent but least frightening terms what had happened to his wife and to urge him to return. We both agreed it would take him at least three days to make the trip. Probably from her hours of naked exposure in a drafty house, she was coughing intermittently, so I told her that my doctor would be passing by to give me an injection and that I'd ask him to check her over at the same time and perhaps recommend something for her cold. To my surprise, she agreed, but without much ado, but when I suggested that she clean up her face for the impending visit, it provoked another screaming spat of abuse. If I didn't think she was beautiful the way she was, why didn't I get the hell out? Who invited me anyway? Etc. After she calmed down, we returned to the TV set and she ate some cottage cheese. The doctor arrived punctually and I went down to the gate to brief him. He followed me into the house and when she saw him administering my bogus jab, she held my hand. When he turned his attention to her, she babbled incoherently but allowed him to listen to her heart and lungs. He produced a bottle of pills and said to me, she should take two of these every two hours. She has the beginning of a nasty infection. I'll drop by again around six. She had been unnaturally calm during his visit, but the storm broke when he asked if she had a girlfriend who could come and sit with her because she might feel drowsy and you don't want to fall. She suddenly turned on the poor man and started belaboring him and pushing him. She yelled and screamed and poured out torrents of abuse on him and all her girlfriends, naming them one by one, reviling them and accusing them of plotting against her. 
When she collapsed with the inevitable tear storm, she sobbed, David's the only one I trust and he's looking after me. At the doctor's car, the doctor said, there's no question. The girl's in big trouble and must go in for psychiatric treatment at once. The responsibility was being lifted from my soldiers. I, so, shoulders. I was relieved and said so, but he shook his head. You told me it would be three days before Olivier gets here, and by California law, the next of kin is the only one who can sign her in. Even I can't do it. Until he gets here, she must not be left alone and lock up all the kitchen hardware because she might do anything. He paused and said kindly, it's going to be tough on you, but you're the friend of the family, and it looks as though you're stuck. He opened the door of his convertible. She's going to offer you sex. That's part of the pattern. If you accept, you'll make things worse. And if you refuse, she'll still make things worse because she'll feel rejected by the only person she trusts. I don't envy you the next three days. What the hell do I do? I asked. I've only been here four hours and I'm already exhausted. I have my own life too. Give her those pills, he said, and get in touch with me. Remember when they're like this, they're very, very cunning. Good luck. He drove away. Back in the house, the nightmare took its course. First, the phone rang and a voice said, hold the line for Miss Luella Parsons, please. It hadn't taken long. Probably a secretary in the produ producer's office had heard him pressing the panic button to the gossip columnists. Luella's well-known drawl came over the phone. She demanded to speak to Vivian. She's sick, I said. She's sleeping. She can't come. Leave a message. Tell her to call Luella Parsons as soon as she wakes. Yes, ma'am, I said. Who was that? Asked Vivian when I went back into the television room. Oh, just Luella, I said. She was instantly transformed. Why don't you want me to speak to Luella? She yelled. She probably wants to do a Sunday story on me. You know I love her. She ran into the kitchen and started looking up the columnist number. I grabbed the phone from Missy's hands and a battle royal took place for its possession. She went for my eyes and testicles with her fingers like hooked claws. So during the sobbing period that followed, I took the doctor's advice and locked up all the sharp kitchen implements I could find. The dreadful day dragged on. During the afternoon, I finally persuaded her to take two of the doctor's pills, which she had regarded with the deepest suspicion. But first, she wanted to take a walk around the small swimming pool. Stark naked as usual, she paraded around the garden, and I prayed that prying journalist eyes could not see through the hedge. When the moment to take the pills came, she grabbed the bottle and ran off, hid it behind her back, and demanded a kiss in exchange for it. This payment having been extracted, she deliberately emptied the contents of the bottle into the deep end of the pool. The doctor paid his second visit, and Vivian refused to let him inside the house, saying he was one of them. I managed to have a few words with him in the garden. I'll give you some more pills, he said. They're strong sedatives. It'll make your life much easier if she'll take them. Is she eating anything? Only cottage cheese, I told him. Try mixing them in there, he suggested. Is she drinking? She asks for a glass of wine now and then. Is that bad? Any stimulant is bad, but don't refuse it. Water it down. He gave news from the producer. I'm in contact with him. He sounds like a good guy. He said to tell you that Olivier is on his way. He's due in 8 o'clock Sunday morning. My heart sank. It was only Thursday evening. He said to tell you that he's put out a press release that she's in bed with a virus and under doctor's care. Good luck. Try to keep a couple of those pills into her stomach and take the phone off the hook. Vivian made the offer the doctor had predicted. I have something for you, she said seductively and ran upstairs giggling. Half an hour later, she called down. Her face was cleaned, her makeup redone, her hair brushed and falling into a golden cloud over her shoulders and she was wearing a short black see-through nightgown. She looked lovely. Come and get it, she whispered from the top of the stairs turning her back in a parody of sexiness and lifting the hem of the nighty. It was not an easy evening for me, to put it mildly, and it ended in a bottle-throwing scene, with Vivian ordering me out of the house, an instruction I longed to but dared not obey. The pills did not have much effect on her. Around midnight, she ate some cottage cheese and drank some wine, in which I had stirred a pill, but they slowed her down for only an hour or two. Then she was as bright and demanding and terrifyingly unpredictable as before. 
I dared not sleep as the long days and interminable nights melted into each other. A dreadful thought began to take place. It was not Vivian whose mind was deranged. It was mine. I became a hollow-eyed zombie, sleepless and utterly exhausted. But Missy never, or I'm sorry, Vivian never showed any signs of tiredness and harried me endlessly to play hide and seek, to flatter her, to comfort her, to fight with her, or to go to bed with her. I found I hated her. Twice a day, the doctor met me in the garden to give me news of Olivier's progress and to inject me with floods of BQE to keep me going. By Saturday evening, I could go no further. I can't make it through tonight, I told the doctor. The plane's on time. Olivier arrives tomorrow morning. Give her a jab and put her out so I can sleep. I can't go on. The doctor looked at me. It's completely illegal, he said, but okay, I'll do it. He outlined the plan. I was to leave the front door open, and at 9 o'clock exactly, the doctor would slip in with a trained nurse who would act as witness and help with the injection and also stay the night to take care of Vivian when she came around. The two of them would hide in the downstairs bathroom, then on some pretext, I would coax her into the hall, grab her, throw her on the ground, and hold her down while she was injected. It's going to be very rough, the doctor said, but it's the only way. Vivian seemed to sense that something was going to happen. For the first time, her eyes lost their wild look. She seemed calm, almost normal, and very vulnerable. She followed me wherever I went. She also talked about her husband. I hope he comes to see me, she said sadly. It was eerie. A few minutes before nine, I told her I was hungry and asked her to help me make a sandwich. She left her favorite place in front of the TV set and put her hand in mine. As we passed through the hall into the kitchen, I caught a glimpse through the curtains of the doctor's car. We puttered about in the kitchen, and I received another reminder of the premonition that had awakened within my charge. Suddenly, Vivian said, you won't let them take me away, will you? For a moment, I thought she too might have seen the car. Who? I asked. Oh, she said mysteriously, they will be coming for me one day. They want to take me away, but you won't let them, will you? Of course not, I said, loathing every second of the dreadful charade that was unfolding. Slowly, I ate my sandwich. When I judged that sufficient time had elapsed from, cons from my conspirators to be in position and ready, I took her hand in mine and led her into the hall. Clumsily, I swung her around, hooked one leg behind her knees, and flung her to the ground. After a first startled gasp, she fought with incredible ferocity and strength. She didn't scream. She was spitting like a panther, biting, clawing, and kicking. I finally managed to pin her arms by kneeling on the elbow joints. I yelled for the doctor. When she saw two strange forms approaching, one in a white uniform and the other with a hypodermic syringe, she screamed long piercing notes of pure animal terror. They've come, they've come. The nurse held her feet and between us we controlled her convulsive struggles while the doctor did his work. It was soon over and as she began to calm down, I avoided her eyes, filled as they were with such blazing hatred at my base betrayal. Later when we carried her to bed, her face was as innocent and as peaceful as a baby's. The nurse cleaned up my many bites and scratches and the doctor gave me something that would enable me to finally sleep. None of us spoke. At six the next day, refreshed but with a leaden conscience and a three-day growth of beard, I drove on my way to the airport through the peaceful emptiness of early morning streets. I felt as though I had returned from far, far away. Vivian Leigh died in 1967, age 53, from complications with tuberculosis. Her ex-husband, Sir Laurence Olivier, remarried and had three children. I wanted to make a comment about Sir Laurence Olivier, who was uh, considered the first modern patriot actor. And so while today there are actors that consider themselves patriots and go abroad and spend money and you know loan out their Oscars. Sir Laurence Olivier was the real deal in many ways. His establishment of the National Theatre, which was committed to speaking the British playwrights such as Shakespeare and Sheridan, was remarkable. 
He was committed to regularly showing the British classics on theater and in film. He starred in over 50 films and his takeover of the Old Vic and National Theater focused on British actors, especially younger actors. Laurence Olivier considered himself a teacher and would frequently invite younger actors into his home so that he could tutor and teach them. He was concerned with making sure Britain remained a theatrical power. He brought forth British heritage in his work, his revamp of the Shakespearean classics, but highlighting British heroes like the Duke of Wellington, for example, is lesser known today. Um, Olivier's commitment to telling uh, British stories through his Henry V film, for example, is profound. Uh, he was committed to the British public and his speeches during World War II are still played today. <laughs>